Okay. Well, thanks for joining us, Sunil. Um, a lot of groups in the county are really interested in the school board election. A lot of groups are sort of split about who to, who to support. And I, I know there's a lot of people uh, that, you know, are, are really interested in this and concerned about the direction of the school board and want to try to figure out who's the best candidate to support. And so we reached out to a lot of different groups and said, you know, would you be interested in interviewing the candidates? And we're going to interview you tonight. And on Monday, we're interviewing Lynn. And I think one of the hopes is that maybe in early September sometime, we would plan a forum that would be more public so everybody can join in. But, um, you know, I think, you know, you are you know sort of the, the issues and the questions that from all the different questionnaires you've had to fill out. And I don't think those, those questions or issues have changed considerably, but I think doing an, an interview, a one-on-one -on -one interview is helpful because then you can go into a little more depth and maybe we can ask follow-up questions as opposed to having one minute answers, et cetera. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. So I wanted to start with the folks from STEPS. I don't know, Delina, Amaya, you guys were, were gonna ask about the boundary analysis. Why don't you, you ask your questions and then uh, we can go from there. Okay, hello. Hi. My name is Delina. I'm from STEPS, Students Towards Equitable Public Schools. Sure. And the first question that we want to ask is, why do you think it is important to conduct the boundary analysis? Boundary analysis? Yeah. Right. So it's important to have the boundary analysis and I would say eventually change uh, in following that uh, because of um, two particular reasons. One is that um, we are not utilizing our uh, facilities as well as we could. And the consequence of that, right? And the consequence of that is that some of our schools um, uh, are, uh, have more resources than the others. And I, and I can explain that, but essentially what the idea is, if you spend some, you know, if you, uh, for example, uh, there's a, my daughter goes to Barnsley Elementary School and Barnsley uh, had an extension uh, a few years ago that cost $13 million, right? And so um, next to Barnsley, not far away, maybe half, you know, three, quarter, three fourths of a mile is a school called Rock Creek Valley. Uh, and while Barnsley is overcrowded, Rock Creek Valley is uh, under enrolled. And really every year, the principal's putting out messages saying, are, are they enough kindergarten students? So if we had moved some students from Barnsley to Rock Creek Valley, we would have saved, I think, a bunch of money uh, in the renovation that we did. And that money could go to some school like South Lake, which is really in a bad shape. So that is a big part of the uh, arguments about, uh, about equity. The second thing is that our schools, as they have resorted themselves over the last, I would say 20 years or so, uh, have become more segregated, right? And so there is much more, um, uh, there is, uh, and this is, you know, racial and economic and, 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 and that segregation is, is then uh, a problem uh, because um, what it does is that it doesn't provide uh, the, um, the learning opportunities that diversity brings. That, I think that's sort of very, very important. But also, you know, some students are not comfortable here and some are not there. So if we are going to try to, um, you know, meet all our students to, uh, you know, all means all, then we have to start to rebalance our resources. Um, and, and I think boundary change is a good way of doing that. So if you're interested more, I put out a pamphlet on this issue. Uh, it's on my website. So if you uh, go to my website, which is sunildasgupta.com, and then if you click on priorities, you will, you know, uh, there's a uh, infographic, there's, I have written tons and tons on this. I've written some, I mean, I've, you know, I've been writing for this for a bunch of, um, for, uh, you know, for some time now. So please go out um, and, and read. Um, there are some very specific proposals I'm making that make it possible to do this. Um, and I think that this is one of the things that distinguishes me 
uh, from my opponent, which is that I have a, an actual plan that around which uh, we can at least have a debate uh, and how to, about how to proceed. Okay, Amaya, did you have any follow-ups or any other questions on this issue? Yes, well, I guess I should introduce myself. Hi, I'm also Maya. I'm from Students Towards Equitable Public Schools, which is STEPS. Um, and so I guess we can just look at your boundary analysis plan that you have to kind of answer the other questions that we have for more of the specific details on um, what you plan to do with the boundary analysis, if you don't want to touch on that right now. Um, no, no, I'm, I'm happy to do it. I just didn't know how much time I should spend uh, doing it. And so there are four things I should, actually three, Importantly, most important three things. One is that, they ha that it has to be about any kind of boundary, new boundary policy we have, right? Needs to be regular. It has to be on, it has to be periodic. It's, it can be that, that we do it only now and then we forget about it. If, so the problem with boundaries is not that they exist, but that they are permanent, right? And so what happens is you put in the boundaries and population shifts, and therefore, you know, the boundaries and, and, and population and demography don't match, right? So in order to be able to do it right over the long term, right, and not be here again in 10 years, I say to have a policy of boundary change that is, that is regular, right? Secondly, the problem often is that we don't look at the issue as a, at a system-wide level, right? Instead, we look at clusters. So think about this sort of abstract example, which is think about three clusters, cluster one, cluster two, and cluster three. They are, I mean, you know, cluster one exists here, two and three. Cluster one is overcrowded. Cluster two is at capacity. And cluster three is under-enrolled. So what is the problem here? What is the problem set? The problem set is cluster one and cluster three. Cluster two, because it's on capacity, it's not, it, you know, it's not, a, it's not part of the problem, right? And so if you look at, if that is your problem set, what is your solution set? Your solution set is to move kids from, you know, cluster one over cluster two to cluster three. Instead, if you had a systemic view, a, a system-wide view of this, then you might be able to move some students from one to two and two to three, and thereby, you know, sort of minimize the dislocation. So that's number two, Regu regular change, system-wide change, uh, system-wide review. And the third thing is to, um, uh, and make it predictable. So I have said in the, uh, in the infographic and in, in what I write is that you decide on a, you know, every, based on birth year and location, you assign a student a um, kindergarten class. On first day of kindergarten class, you assign that student a sixth grade class. And on the first day of sixth grade, you assign them the ninth grade class. And those never change, right? Those never change. So you are actually predicting out five, six, seven years where, you know, where, where, your, where your child is gonna go. And even if you make changes, you're predicting out those changes, right? But next year, we look at the same problem and we see that that population shifted or whatever we need to change left or right. And so then you look at the problem and say that the following year, right, uh, based on birth year, we might have a different, um, a different school. Now, the problem is with this is sometimes, you know, you might you would separate uh, siblings that are too cl that are close. And so we don't want that. Right. So what we want to do then is to give that family an option to automatically transfer their older child from the school that is presumably overcrowded to the school that is uh, under enrolled. So that way we keep families together. We also get our public policy goals, right? We also, and, and we have, and we make sure that we are not pulling, um, you know, a large number of students from their friends or sort of uh, from their schools and the communities. So it's a planned approach, it's a predictable approach, but it is, but you, you can only work if you do it regularly and do it system wide. Does that make sense? If you have questions, I'm happy to, I can talk about this for a long time. <laughs> no, yes, that does make sense. Um, but another question we did have is kind of like, how would you go about facing opposition against the boundary analysis and how would you kind of make them understand that it is a necessary change that needs to happen? 
Right. So this is a question I've thought about a lot. So the, if you look at my plan, right, it answers some questions. Is this, if you do it system-wide and you can move from cluster one to cluster two to cluster three, as I just ex explained, the worry about long bus rides, bus commutes is mitigated, right? If you're not sending kids, so the, so the BOE promises adjacency, right? That's a promise made by the BOE. That's a commitment made by the BOE. Often, however, that commit, the logic of that commitment is not clear. And the logic of the commitment can be made clear if we adopt a system-wide review uh, approach rather than a cluster-by-cluster -cluster review approach. Okay, so that's so, so that on the issue of, oh my God, you're gonna send my kids to the other end, the, uh, you're, you're gonna bust my kids so far away. I think the, the, the plan that I propose has a solution. The second, so the second complaint that I've uh, heard about is that, you know, you're gonna pull, uh, you're gonna take uh, my kid away uh, from their friends and from their cohort. That's also not the case, right? Because you are not making any change through the time that they are, that, that, that those children uh, are, are in school. And then, even then you're moving cohorts, you're not moving single, uh, single students, right? So I think those are answers to the, most, you know, sort of vociferous um, uh, uh, opposition uh, to uh, boundary change. And I think my plan includes that. The third thing I would say is this, is I am the person that will go out and actually talk to communities for, a, for as long as it takes. One of the big problems with the way the boundary uh, analysis went down is that, no, that, that the BOE leadership did not go out and make the case for it. And suddenly we had December 11th and we said, oh no, how can we do this, right? This, the case for this has to be made by our leadership. That's why I want to be on the school board. That's Sunil. a big change. Sunil, I have a follow-up question. Sure. Uh, you know, people are concerned about long bus rides, and yet a lot of parents are sending their kids on hour or two-hour bus rides to magnet programs. Sure. And, uh, you know, one of the goals of the boundary analysis was trying to reduce segregation of the schools. Uh, and yet, and that was the goal of the magnet programs, is to bring white kids into my high minority schools and yet they're segregated within the school, there's segregation within the school. What, what's your view on magnet programs and uh, the problem of segregation within schools? So I want to point out that fixing boundaries, right, is not, is not, it will not fix every issue, right? Um, and I don't think inside school segregation is, uh, is addressed by, um, is, is, is addressed by, uh, boundary change, but it can, it can, but not entirely. I think though, with magnets themselves, so they, they do fulfill a purpose. And so what I think is they, they, they are able to pull uh, certain kinds of students um, to um, a particular school and, but it's not worked. The original plan has not worked in fact, right? So, but we need to use boundary change and magnets and sort of, I wouldn't call, so let me rephrase that. It's better to call them special programs rather than magnets because there are other programs that attract people as well that are not technically sort of selective magnets, right? So there, so for example, uh, Lloydeman is a perf uh, performing arts school, right? Uh, and um, Parkland is an aerospace uh, middle school. So there are schools that have specialty programs. Those programs in those schools are available to every child. There's no distinction between whether you're in the so-called uh, uh, magnet program or not. So they are all school magnets. So specialty programs do have a role of pulling certain uh, students, but that is not sufficient. There has to be a push and pull. And the pull is the specialty programs. The push is the um, you know, a, a new boundary policy. So that's the hope, that's, that's my hope. It's like a push and pull thing. Uh, so, so but, but what about the, the segregation within the schools that Magnum- so, so, okay, 
so segregation inside schools, especially with respect. So I would prefer to have schools where all the children are offered the same program, right? So as such as in Lloydemann. In cases where there are current running magnet programs, I think it is, it is important for us to do two things. We have to better, so we, and we've, we've done some of this. So first of all, universal um, screening uh, in, uh, for magnet programs has helped, right? And it has broadened somewhat uh, the um, um, uh, recruitment. I think though the larger problem is that, that a lot of our students are not prepared well enough. And I've talked to a lot of teachers uh, that teach in magnets and outside um, who say that, you know, we are, that, you know, for example, there are schools, um, middle schools that don't have math teams, right? And so if they don't have math teams, it's very hard for them then thereafter to get into uh, a, a math science magnet, right? Because that's where they really sort of hone their um, uh, abilities. So we have to, of course, bring those, uh, you know, the, those services, uh, those uh, opportunities uh, everywhere. So it's an, you know, we talk about an opportunity, uh, achievement gap, but behind it lies a big opportunity gap. And if we fix that, I believe we can move forward. Uh, in that direction. But, you know, I, it, it is something of, you know, um, the segregation within school is, 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 is concerning. Okay, I was gonna ask Carolyn from Racial Justice Now, she, to ask a question next, she wants to ask about SROs, so. <laughs> Hello, good evening. Hi. Nice to meet you. Likewise. Um, so my question, um, given the tenuous relationship between police and black communities and other communities of color, and given that more than 50% of MCPS students are black and brown, what role do you think police officers have in public schools? Um, if I were elected, I would move to end the SRO program. I want to be clear. Uh, I have come to this in a long and circuitous way. Uh, <laughs> I, now I study a lot about American politics now, uh, and, and I, that's what I teach. Uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm a, uh, I teach politics and government in, at the UMBC, but my dissertation was on the uh, militarization of police forces in six different countries. Unfortunately, I did not choose the US as part of my dissertation. I should have, but that was a mistake. And today, if we look at what you look at the research, we find that um, you know um, arrests of students of color uh, in schools uh, where there are SROs is higher. There is some preliminary evidence to suggest that test scores may be lower. I haven't seen a case or heard of one where an SRO actually prevented a shooting. Right at Parkland the SRO ran away at way back in Columbine. He was away at lunch and walking back. Now that happens. And if you look at Montgomery County, until recently, until very recently, the, uh, an SRO that was assigned to a particular school worked four, day, four 10 hour days as per the police union contract. So as it is, we left that school unguarded, so to speak, for that day. We now have 23 SROs in 25. So two of our high schools are still not, they don't have SROs. So my point is that I, so instead of having SROs, I think we should have more mental health workers, school psychologists and counselors, and really more teachers. So this has been the, one of the first calls I made, which is that we need more teachers, staff and counselors, because right now the students don't have a, a trusted adult that they can go to uh, in school. If you want, if we want, right, to have safe schools, we have to have more mental health care and trauma treatment for our children. If we want a safer schools, we need to have better school community relations. Schools are not fortresses. They belong to our communities. And that relationship has to be open and we have to know. I went to my son's school the other, uh, last year sometime to pick up his uh, musical instrument. 
I knew the principal, I knew everybody, but I couldn't enter the school building uh, beyond the, uh, I beg your pardon, go beyond the office. I'm not sure. I mean, if you don't know your community, that's the kind of security you impose. You keep people out. I want school gardens where the community uh, can come and participate. I want the community so, so much inside in, as part of the school, the home and school partnership so much, so, so much more robust that that old conception of security doesn't need to be there. Security can be a theater, right? Or security can be real. I'm proposing real security, real safety for our students, not the theater of security. Thank you. And I have a follow-up question, if you don't mind. Go ahead. What would you do to encourage, uh, if you're elected, what would you do to encourage uh, your counterparts in positions of power to remove SROs from Montgomery County Public Schools? Well, I will, first of all, this, right? I'm gonna lobby with them. So anything that the board does needs five votes. Okay, uh, and so, uh, and then the county council is involved as well in, in, in some of this. So we have to uh, build um, alliances. We have to make proposals that make sense. And that's how we are gonna win. And also I'm gonna need your help, right? It's not like just because I get elected, um, you know, um, half the board decides, no, Sunil got elected, so let's go with him. No, that's not gonna happen, right? So I, so I will, I will need continued support if elected to be able to push this. And I will, I will push it. Thank you very much. Okay, I was gonna ask Mike uh, from Impact to ask a next question about reopening. So hi Sunil, just uh, kind of a two part question. So the first one is in your perspective, what's it gonna take for us to reopen schools safely given COVID-19? And then the other part is that we also know and what we've seen during the first few months that schools were closed is that it proved to be a real challenge for some of our immigrant communities and low income communities and potential gaps get bigger when people don't have what they need to actually succeed in school. So I wanna know what your take is on that and what suggestions you would bring as a school board member to try to resolve some of those issues. My hope is that it doesn't go too far into your term that we have to deal with this, but we don't know when it's gonna be ended at this point. Mike, every day, the more I think about it, honestly, and I think that the coming year is not looking good. First, so what, what, what needs to happen for schools to reopen? The infection rates need to go down. Our expect, not just infection rate, but our expectation of infect, in, in, infection rates needs to be lower. So we should not, we should expect them to go down, right? Uh, not, just, not, not just trending. So that's the first thing. Second, that we provide all the necessary resources for our teachers and students to be able to go into the school, right? We haven't done that. The, so the federal government has given us some money. It's 120, 185 million to the county of which I think 25 went to uh, the schools, right? Um, the state has not given money. The county is actually cutting and not, get, not giving us more money to be able to do this. And the county has a $500 million rainy day fund. It is pouring. When is a rainy day fund to be used? So we need the resources to be able to put in place all the things we need to be able, whether it's the ventilation or there's a PPE or, you know, or, or uh, the spaces and all of that. But I understand that money is a problem and all. So I have actually, there are four things that we need to do now in order to prepare to bring students back in when that happens, right? And, and it's very important to, to, to make that plan now and to work out the kinks now if we are looking at um, January 29th. If we don't do it now, we are not gonna be able to do it January 29th. So there's great urgency for us to focus on this, right? Because you are right. All those kids that are not being able to log on are logging on sporadically 
or have IEPs that have small groups and the services are not coming, right? They are falling behind faster than anybody else. So in this, the plan that MCP has tentatively put out to bring back K to second, sixth and ninth grades is I think wrong. So that's 50,000 children, which means at 15, um, 15 students per teacher, that is 3,500 teachers. We don't know if we have 3,500 teachers willing to go back, right? This, so rather than that, here's what, here's my, here's what the things that I think are important. First, equity first. Bring back students that are not being able to log on at all first. IEP, small group, one-on-one. -on -one, one -on -one. ESOL, and then, um, students reading below grade level. I think those, and that's, that's, that's the way to go first. Then when the general population goes, go, you know, go for the younger children before the older children. Okay. So that's the first thing. Second, we need a, the MCPS did a survey of, of parents and, and teachers. We need a census. We don't need a survey. We need a count. We need a count of how many teachers are willing to return, how many parents are, which, and which of their kids they're willing to send. So here was, the, here was my thinking, is that if we had a survey that laid out a bunch of options that said, I, can, I will go back now, through I will never go back. So in between, there are many gradations of that. And you give that a small survey to tie that to every timesheet for every employee, and tie that to a report card at the end of the at the end of the year, or to the new system that we are going to build. We are uh, debuting right now to uh, you know, uh, and tie it to so that every uh, you know family fills it out. And if somebody doesn't, we call them, right? And the thing is, just because they make a choice at time A, doesn't mean that they can't change their uh, uh, mind afterwards. So you give them an option. Go, you are you make a choice now. And you can go back and change your mind as many times as you want just by logging into your dashboard and giving us a reason for why you change. So that will give us an evolving view of how many teachers, how many students, what is, the, what is the situation. Right now we have a survey. I know parents that filled it up five times and I know zip codes that have zero responses. This was not the way to do it. A survey like, a, a, you know, a census could have been designed and it was a, and we can still do it. And we have to do it now though, because if, if we delay this more and more and more, we are not gonna be able to be ready in February. Third thing, look for spaces, because we will need space. We, will, we, we don't have enough spaces. What, what does the county have that is closed? What, you know, can we move um, elementary school um, kids uh, and have them in uh, have them in high school if you know uh, presumably uh, high school opens last, right? Those kinds of decisions have to be made. And the fourth thing, protocol. We don't know what will happen if a kid comes in and 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 has fever. We don't know. What are we going to do? Right. So those protocols have to be worked out. We don't know what happens if a teacher falls sick. What is our, what is, where is our substitute bench? Who is responsible? And then remember, even after you've chosen this, done this, there is a matching problem. So you may get, you know, 2000 teachers willing to go back right now. And I know, I know some teachers who said they're going to put on hazmat suits and go back. Right? They're willing to go back right now. But you know, they may, be not, they may not be a grade match. So, the, you know, you'll have a, a eighth grade teacher wanting to go back, but, you know, we need more second grade, second grade teachers. That matching process has to happen. So, you know, this, so, we, so what I'm saying is that the planning for reopening has to start now if we are taking this seriously, right? We have to get the funding and we have to plan now. And from what I'm seeing, we are not. And I'm really, really concerned. 
so then people what, what about increasing how do we increase the effectiveness of distance learning because so many kids are online and they're i don't think they're getting effective instruction yes sir so i just want to tell you if i if elected i will be the only board member to have actually taught online for years right oh i have taught online for i think seven eight years now and there are things i've learned the first of which is face-to-face -face teaching and online teaching are completely different things are absolutely different things so i have a set of uh, um, uh, uh, things that we have to do, but the most important of that, the most important of, the, of them all is teacher training. Imagine this, a fourth grade teacher, right, her most valuable, her most valuable asset is her ability to run her classroom. And we have just taken that away, right? We are now asking her to become a content producer, content generator, right? So we are breaking down the composite and complex task of teaching into its content producer, customer service, assessment, others, right? And we are saying, now you will produce four hours of content every day. Okay? It's not easy. It is not easy to produce video content at that, uh, 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 on that scale by so many people. It's not. So there are many things we could have done, but none of them are easy. People say, oh, there is a lot of content available uh, you know, on, in Khan Academy. Absolutely. But to have the knowledge to say, I'm going to put, pull this Khan Academy video to fit this lesson unit means that you need to know the Khan Academy um, library well. Who knows the Khan Academy library well? We didn't know that. I don't know the Khan Academy library well. I didn't expect most teachers that know the Khan Academy library well. So this is a, so this transition needs an entire overhaul. All right, in the, the, the direction of that overhaul should be more project-based learning. So we move away from Socratic learning to more project-based learning. We have to change the way we assess students, right? That's one of the first things I realized, that the assessment process changes. The assessments have to be, um, the frequency, the type, the intention of those assessments changes, right? So we have to be mindful of those things and, 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 and train our teachers to be, do this. Lastly, we have to set the right expectation for students and parents. Right now, we've set an expectation for parents that we are going to approximate the traditional school. That is the expectation we are setting for parents. And that is an expectation we are going to disappoint them with because we are not going to do that. It's not possible. It's not gonna happen, right? I absolutely believe that we should have, you know, we should have thought about, thought through this. We cannot, I mean, this, these long hours on Zoom, I know many parents want them, but really, talk to the kids. I joined TikTok recently, and literally, I got like 600 comments of them, 500, uh, no, maybe 300, were about, Zooms are too long, dude. That's what they said. And these are high school uh, students, right? And imagine elementary school students sitting in front of, e even with the 15 minute break or whatever, it doesn't work, the power of online education, it lies in asynchronous material delivery. We deliver material asynchronously and we flip the classroom. That's the power of online. That's where the power of online uh, education comes. And it seems, as Jeanette Dixon said, 
People making these decisions have never taught online. I didn't say this, she said that. And Jennifer, you had a question, Jennifer's from MCP, MCC PTA. Oh, I can't hear you. There you go, does that work? Yep. Good, hi Sunil, how are you? Good Jennifer, how are you? I'm good. Um, I know you and uh, your opponent are, are longtime MCC PTA people coming from the PTA background. Uh, so you've had experience in, um, in dealing with the board from that perspective. So uh, I'm going to kind of, my questions go off some of the things that you've talked about before. And I'm going to pivot a little bit to, to looking at things sort of from a long-term perspective, because I know we've been talking about some of the short-term uh, issues that we're facing right now. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about or ask you a little bit about what happens when we go back to school and we're back in the buildings. And I wanted to ask about uh, CIP issues, funding for, for school construction. Um, we, we from MCCPTA, as you know, advocate the board for funding for overcrowding issues that you referred to with the boundary study, um, also for major capital projects for schools that you talked about with, uh, for people who go to schools where they need uh, improvements because the ceiling tiles are falling down and they can't go to the bathroom because there's, you know, the faucets aren't working and the toilets aren't working. So I guess my question to you is, um, as a board member, if you're elected, uh, where would your priorities be when you look at CIP funding? Are you approaching it any differently than uh, has been approached in the past? Uh, when you look at uh, the factors that the board looks at for, for example, major capital projects and who gets the funding and how it's awarded, versus uh, all of the schools that you referred to who are over capacity and have been waiting uh, for, for funding to get uh, relief from that over capacity versus all of the schools that have been waiting for years for improvements and major capital projects like such as Poolsville and Wooten. So I, I send it over to you to say, you know, what is your approach to these kind of issues? Thank you. Um, it, those are very good um, and sort of important questions. Uh, and I've actually spent a lot of time uh, thinking exactly about them. So first of all, let me, so one, so you, st you have a baseline that you started today, right? Some, there are overcrowded schools, there are schools that need all of this. I did some forensic, which is ask why this is the case. And a lot of times I found that this is the case because we neglected certain schools for long, persistent neglect, not for a year or two or six or one CIP uh, um, uh, cycle, but several CIP cycles, right? So whether it's Poolsville or South Lake or Nielsville or Eastern or, you know, uh, so many others, uh, Twinbrook, you know, so many others, right? These schools were neglected while other schools received all the money. It's like the Barnsley and Rock Creek Valley situation. We put money mainly where there is overcrowding. And that's what we have done. While, you know, and everybody knows this, 10, 000, in, according to 2019 numbers, 10,860 uh, students were overcrowded in 100 of our schools. And in the other 100 of our schools, we had 9,357 open seats, right? So. I'm not saying that all those seats are shiftable. Even if we got 30% of them, we would save a lot of money. We would save a lot of money that could then be directed. And the thing is, obviously we can't do this in one year. And obviously this problem has accrued year after year and decade after decade, right? So it's not possible, I think, to say that one fell swoop, we'll, we'll clear the backlog. It's not gonna happen, right? But what we have to do is to tie the, our um, utilization and our capital projects much more tightly. So instead of spending money on Barnsley, maybe if we had spent that money 
on Nielsville, the people in Clarksburg being moved to Nielsville would not be so upset. So I think there is a way to do this. I think, and, and what is, and, and the past to redo the sort of decades of neglect, it's gonna take time. But that's what we have to do. We have to make sure that all our schools actually have what they need, rather than some of our schools having more and others having less systematically over time, such that some people say we are two or three more, three school systems, not one. Um, I was going to ask and see if Carlos uh, and, or, and or Ed wanted to ask a question from our revolution now. Carlos, did you have a question you wanted to ask? Um, yes. Uh, I wanted to ask about the uh, inclusion of uh, black history, um, black history in public schools. Um, what is your thoughts on um, having more white students learn black history and, and also getting more uh, students in general to learn black, black history? What is your um, plan for that? So some of our overall history stuff is set by the AP course, right? So we are, you know, we are pushing in that. That's the thing that we are pushing towards, right? And so, in, and, and, and some sort of, sort of larger syllabus issues. And um, I, you know, I think first of all, we need, we need curriculum reform for sure. We need curriculum reform that includes, that is a much more diverse and culturally competent cur curriculum, right from, you know, from, from elementary school, right? We don't need to wait until uh, we get to um, uh, high school to have, um, uh, you know, black history curriculum. No, we have to really uh, make sure that, you know, we have a much more inclusive curriculum right from the get-go. So that's what I would say. Um, I would like, in terms of just history, I would like to reorient, I think, our teaching of history around Howard Zinn's work, if it's at all possible. On the People's History of the United States is a fantastic book around which to reorient ourselves, right? I'm a political scientist. I've, you know, I, I'm a, a half a historian, half my committee was uh, uh, all historians. So I am acutely aware of historiography and the shortcomings of uh, of, of, of um, the history curriculum that we have. And I think really we need, we'll, I will push, in fact, I will push, um, you know, sort of the, uh, the top college board uh, and all of those places to, to be more inclusive so that there is this sort of uh, effect that we have. Uh, but ab you're absolutely right. This is, a, this is an issue that needs to be fixed. Not, so it's important for the students but you know, also it's important for staff diversification. So our staff, if we want to have more diversified staff, if they are coming to teach curriculum that does not resonate with them, well, they are not gonna stay. They're not gonna stay. So in fact, for a many, many reasons, we need to fix this. Wonderful. Um, and just a follow up, um, what do you, what are your thoughts on having like black history as a subject in itself, like separate from like regular American history class? Do you feel like it should be kept separately or we should just encompass all of it together? I have heard both sides of this. And I was, I was at a, on a Zoom recently that they were debating this actually quite, quite uh, intelligently about you know, sort of, you know, what, uh, you know, what the pros and cons are. So I would say, right, I think if you, we need, so from my, from my gut says, right, that if we had a more inclusive general history course that was, that was mandatory, um, you know, so as social studies, then that would be a way to go alongside a, uh, a black history uh, elective. Um, but there may be a time, there may be a time when, uh, when we do, um, uh, a, uh, a, 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 an entire, uh, entire course uh, for uh, different, uh, for, for groups. I think also 
maybe to think about it as black and brown history rather than just black history in sort of the long term in, in, in that way. I mean, maybe BIPOC history. I'm, I'm sort of thinking aloud at this point because this is not, yeah. you know, the specifics, you know, I have not, you know, I've not said, oh, this is how we should do it. But, but know this, I have written curriculum. I have written entire programs. I have created entire programs, right? That kind of academic experience my opponent does not have. Right? I, ha I run an academic program, I hire faculty, I manage faculty, I write curriculum, I oversee all those things I do, sure. right? And so that really sets me apart, the academic management and, and planning part of it. Cool, um, and one more question that's not on the same topic of the um, Black History uh, class is back to the uh, SROs. Mm -hmm. um, I know you have said um, that you want to uh, remove them. The, the uh, funds that are designated to SROs, where do you see those um, moving to specifically? If we can lay our hands on it. Is yeah, if we can. <laughs> if we can, and I'm not sure that is the case. So just with that caveat, mm -hmm. I would like more, um, uh, I would like more counselors and school psychologists. Wonderful. Um, one, thank you for being here. Uh, Thank you for the great answers. Um, Ed, do you have anything um, you want to ask at all? Carlos, you asked the question I was just about to, so thank you very much. Well done. I know Walter was, has to leave in a few minutes. Did you have any questions you wanted to ask before you leave? Walter? You're, you're muted. Okay. Um, Okay, well, I'm gonna open the floor up and see if anybody has follow-ups or any uh, questions. Oh, right, I was trying to see if I'm unmuted. Uh, no, actually, um, I believe. Uh, uh, what was that, Walter? It looks like, well, no, no, I don't have anything. I was interested in the police issue that that question is. Okay, Laura, you had a question. Yes, so thank you. Thank you so much for being here um, to talk with us. Um, and I was really the happy. Police issue. Maybe I can actually uh, tie through the police end. So it's already been answered, addressed. Okay, thanks. Laura. Oh, great. Yes, so I was really glad to see SROs and curriculum um, addressed. So thank you. I wanted to ask more broadly, um, what would you highlight as the main ways your election to the Board of Education would promote equity and boost diversity? So if you just had to pick out the ways, what would you highlight? Well, if I elected, I would be the second Asian American elected to the board in its 140 year history. Second, not the first. The first was, uh, but still, it, it's the first came and went, and there's been a big gap. Um, so, but a range of policies, it's not just about, you know, ethnicity or who I am, or where I come from, right? Or what my personal experience is, but also the, 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 if you look at the policies that I am uh, pushing for, right, um, I think the best chance of having a new school boundary policy is my plan. And if we did that, can you imagine that? Can you imagine that over the long, how much, what that means in terms of equity over the long term? That we can rebalance our resources as population and demography shifts. So we have given the board an instrument with which to fix future problems, not just the current one, right? Think about what it means, right? For, um, uh, for curriculum diversity, right? For a curriculum to be culturally competent, for, for it to speak to our truly diverse population and hopefully our truly diverse teachers and staff, right? And when we get all of that, I think it'll be tremendous. You know, MCPS is a large, difficult ship, but it is also incredible 
for its size and complexity and its beauty. Right? We can get it right. We can get it right. There are, we have to develop the tools to get it right. Right now, we can't even get ourselves to announce what we are going to do in the fall. You know, even we say we'll do it five days before school opens. I mean, the complete disconnect there is just appalling. We should have made the decision a long time ago, allow teachers to train and get ready and then plan for a return, um, a physical return to school buildings. I don't know. So imagine how much we have lost because we haven't made those decisions. I think there was a question, I think it was Mike who said, right? That, um, you know, uh, so many of our kids uh, have fallen behind. So no, I, so I, I don't think they've fallen behind in the sense that everybody's fallen behind. So nobody is, you know, um, so, but there are people that there are kids that have fallen, uh, you know, are, have suffered more than others. And to say then that you'll, in, that, that you'll bring in transition grades before going for the most impacted students, that doesn't make sense. So you offered a policy that was, you know, K, to, K through two, sixth, sixth grade and ninth grade, because those are your transition grades. But those may, that may not necessarily be where we should be focused on, right? So look at the equity, we would look at the benefits. If, I were to, if we were to move in the direction of what I was saying, is that if we had a policy of equity first, if we brought back, right, the most impacted students first, I think we would have an effect on equity, right? That's the way to do it with real policy that really sort of lifts the bolts. Right now, we can, I mean, it is really crazy for me to think that we are going to announce our um, fall plan five days before schools open. I mean, I don't know where you, what, what's your belief system, whether, whether you agree with me or not on things, but that just seems like a recipe for disaster. Uh, Carolyn had a follow-up question. Carolyn? Yeah. Yes. Um, let me put the camera on. I am trying to figure out how to phrase this. This is um, so bear with me. But you know, you you're mentioning uh, the plans and the the ways to get to equity, and um, you know, these are not new issues in our county uh, by any means at all. Uh, that have been a, a challenge since for decades. Sure. <laughs> um, I I as a as a as a born and raised Montgomery County native. Um, and as an advocate who's been in organizing for some years now, I don't think that there is a lack of plan around equity, but a lack of will towards it um, and a lack of will to disrupt the, the whatever interest uh, of those who have the most power, which often goes against racial equity in this county. So how do you plan to, or what are your thoughts around um, working against that. It's a very powerful mechanism and it, you know, it hasn't been able to been shaken free in this county in my lifetime of about Carolyn, 40 years. Right. <laughs> Car to, but to me, to me, honestly, a plan without will is not a plan. A plan without will is a faint, right? To me, that's, I mean, it doesn't count. Really. And we have lots of those. We have yeah, lots of good that's, plans that's, that's exactly without right. the will. That's exactly right. <laughs> That's exactly it. So just take one example of this with the school boundaries. Go see that plan, right? Just pull it up. I mean, if you, if you all agree, I can even pull it up for you all, right? I don't know if, if, this, if, if, if that's what you want to do, but I'm happy to pull it, go to my website, pull it up and share my screen with you and show it to you, show everybody. The thing is that it's not you know, you have to talk to people and say to them that we are not trying, that there is a way to do this without sending a, um, a Gaithersburg kid um, to Silver Spring. We are not trying, that's, you know, once I think parents, families start to believe that, start, try to understand that, right? I think they're gonna come around. 
It's I, not as if, you know, people are, uh, are, are, are completely, uh, yes, they will protect privilege. Everybody Absolutely. protects privilege. Everybody protects privilege. But we, so the, the point is, do we have a mechanism, right, of, of, of doing something that sort of makes it palatable, but also keeps pushing in the right direction? So my plan is not going to fix all equity problems tomorrow. Or st I'm not going to sit here and tell you that in two or three or five years, I will have solved the diversity problem. No, but what I have proposed is an instrument that will get you there every year. Little by little, it'll get you there. But we will, we will get there provided we ha have consensus on a plan where we actually make a difference. Otherwise, we will make, we, even if we have school boundary change, a one-time change, the problem has not gone away. You've just punted it for another 10 years. And w when development happens, when population changes again, and demography changes, you are back to square one. So join me, join me in asking for regular boundary review and adjustment. So um, Scott, with your permission, can I pull that up? Or do you think that's not okay? Um, I, I don't know if we have time. I, I would just, oh, yeah. people to, you can put your website up if you want and people in the chat. The website's right there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sunildascupta.com. There we yeah. go. So go to priorities and just scroll down a little and you'll see this beautiful red uh, infographic, right? And by it, you'll see a longer explanation. And if you want to know more, re go to research and writing and you'll have every, everything you need. Right? I think, Thank you. so yes. But we need, so, okay. The academic and academic management and planning part is one thing that I bring. The second part I bring is, you know, public policy, right? And the knowledge of public policy, how it is made, how it is pushed, what are the levers that you use in order to get, you know, to, to win. But that's, I've been teaching that for 20 years now. This is, you know, um, so I feel sometimes like, so some, a lot of people ask me, do you still want to be board of education member now? You know, after COVID and all Like, Listen, the reason I wanted to do this is because I'm extraordinarily fortunate. I came to this country in 1995 with less than $1,500 in my pocket. And this country and public, edu public uh, um, institutions, um, higher education, no doubt, gave me an MA and a PhD. Right, I, then it gave me a job at Brookings and a job at Georgetown and a job at UMBC. I am, I am beyond grateful for all that, I, all that public education has done for me. I have three kids in the system. I care, and the youngest is going into fourth grade. I'll be here for a long time. I'm commit, you know, I want this system to succeed. I want a, you know, a, a, a really strong school system that brings its students and, and all its students and we can, you know, um, and, and, and actually makes the county vibrant again. Count, the county has a fuddy daddy uh, reputation right now, <laughs> right? And all our young people that graduate from high school just wanna go to DC and elsewhere uh, as soon as they graduate. I hope they'll stay. I hope we'll be an exciting place to stay, right? Because of our school system will be, you know, will be rocking once more. You know what I was thinking about? Student journalism. Not all of our um, high schools have robust newspapers or student, student media outlets. And that is so sad, right? We ought to have a strong student journalism program at every of our high school, and certainly I think most of our middle schools, as many of our middle schools as we can. And why? Because what it does is that it takes student journalists make sure, and have repeatedly done this. I've seen this in Rockville where my son goes, right? When Rockville was the first, Rampage, the newspaper, was the first to break the story 
about lead in the in school water some like six years ago now. And Rampage did that. They got the testing kits and they did those tests in their school and they wrote a report. You know what happened? The faculty advisor who was a friend of mine, she had to leave and she teaches at JDS now. We, ha we can't let that happen. We need Jessica back because that's, you know, we have to protect our faculty advisors. We have to protect our student journalists. That's how we'll get these, you know, solid newspapers. And you know what can what they can do after that? There are hundreds of bureaus in uh, Washington DC wanting uh, content producers all the time. It's a job creation. It, it's a pla it's a placement opportunity. It is also a way to bypass the 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 ridiculous rankings uh, made by U.S. News World Report and others. If you look in the U.S. News World Report rankings, Whitman is 95 last year, right? Watkins Mill, which is 20 miles away, not much, 20 miles away, right? Is 8,800 something. But you know what? Watkins Mill has a rockin' school newspaper. It has... The Watkins Mill Current is a fantastic newspaper. And I'll tell you this, right? If we could measure school quality by the, by the journalism that, the, that, that students produced, I, and, and we marketed that, we would say to, we would be able to fight back against these false rankings. There are so many ways in which we can do better. There are so many ways. Okay, well, thank, thank you very much. I, I don't know if anybody has any final questions or remarks, but I think we've pretty much asked most of the questions we were going to ask, and I really appreciate your time. Sure. And, uh, and what, Mike, you had a, something you wanted to say? Yeah, I wanted to ask one more question. Sure. Just, just a quick one. So could you just describe how you think the relationship between the Board of Education should be with the superintendent and anything you would bring that would shake things up a little bit in terms of how that's been up to this point in time? <laughs> Good question, Mike. I want to say this delicately. <laughs> uh, I will be an independent voice. I will be an independent, informed, and expert voice, right? I come from the same academic backgrounds as them. I will stand up to them toe to toe in a way that I don't think you have seen in some time. And that is not to say I want not to have a collaborative relationship. I think the board functions best when there is collaboration. But think about who, are, who is being replaced for at this, at this art at large seat, Jeanette Dixon. She's your most vocal member right now. I'm sorry to see her go. At the very least, we should have a very vocal member replace her. Scott, can I ask one more question too? Sure, absolutely, go ahead. Um, Sunil, I wanted to ask, uh, this is sort of a relationship question as well, but a relationship uh, with parents and students uh, and the community members. Uh, I, I wanted to know what you, what you would do to engage family, uh, families and students, especially those from um, ones that have less of a voice, uh, from minority backgrounds, lower socioeconomic backgrounds, uh, families who maybe English is not their first language. I know we see often when there's an, an issue in front of the board, uh, people who speak loudest sometimes get the, get the most uh, airtime before the board. And I want to know what uh, efforts you might make to try to reach into those communities that don't often have that kind of access to board members, how you would try to find out what their opinions were on issues that were before the board. Okay, two part answer. One is I will go to them, not expect to come to me, right? I will have community meetings in communities, not expect them to show up at, you know, at, at Carver Center all the time and then sort of have this really, 
I don't know why there's a tradition in the board of being buttoned up. I hope at the very least to break that down, right? So that's, that's the more practical side that I will be reaching out. Perhaps if the Tacoma Park City Council members can have a newsletter, surely the BOE members can have a newsletter of some sort, right? Uh, reach out, meet them where they are, right? And um, so that's the practical part. The philosophical part I will I actually wanna, uh, wanna mention, and, and, and I think you know this already, um, the home and school partnership has been broken in MCPS or at least in need of repair for a long time, right? Uh, we don't, you know, uh, we hand our kids to the school and the school closes its doors and they'll hand us back at the end of the day. So it's sort of this fortress school mentality that I think is, 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 a, is a problem. And I don't know, some of you might want to really read what I think. And I wrote an op-ed uh, in the Baltimore Sun last year. Uh, and so if you Google Baltimore Sun in my name, it should come up. Um, anyway, um, so I think the, the practical way in which to solve the philosophical problem is to, to say it's not only you know, parents that are missing from this homeschool partnership, but in fact, teachers are missing. So specifically, if you look at the PTA, there is no T in the PTA. Where is the T? How many teachers do you know are part of the PTA? It is a rare school probably Renee Johnson's school only, <laughs> where, where you know, a large number of teachers are part of, uh, uh, of, of the PTA. Not in my experience, not where I was PTA president or PTA member or anything, right? So the, so the question is, if we, so, so the solution is, right, is uh, if we can get the T back in, I think you will get more parents come because parents, really don't want to come to a PTA meeting to listen to Sunil Dasgupta talk about how important engagement is. They wanna to come to PTA meetings because they are able to, to see and hear from their teachers. But today teachers are stressed, they don't have time, and we can't add more to their plate without, without actually um, sort of reducing some part. So I think that, it, that you're absolutely right we absolutely have to think about um, the home and school partnership. We absolutely have to think about voices that are not heard, right? Going to those communities rather than expecting to come to, come to us is the first thing, but also we have to have a much different view of what, how that, um, that, that relationship works. Maybe that relationship, the, the, the relationship I think first of all needs to be revitalized in every school building, and only then you'll get them to come to Carver. I don't think there is a jump from, you know, um, you, you can't jump that. Uh, so we really need to rebuild um, the home and school partnership at the school level as well. And there, I think bringing teachers back in is, is, uh, is very, very important. You know, in my daughter's elementary school, 25 years ago, they had a, a full-time parent outreach coordinator who was bilingual. And she was an incredible link to the community and knew everybody and knew all the parents. And it was really helpful, something to think about. Absolutely. And so in cases where there are, there are PPWs, uh, you know, they, and in, in, they work well. But PPWs in some schools, have, you know, one, one person will have three schools now, right? Right now, I mean, can we get a nurse in each building? Just before we open, I mean, I just want to say, can we get a nurse in each building? Because right at the very least, when we reopen, we need that. Okay, any last uh, remarks or, or things? Yes. This? Yeah, Carla. Just, uh, one question, and it's back to the um, SROs. I know that it's, a, um, it's gonna be a hard push to remove them. Uh, because you have a lot of parents who are saying, well, they, they, they want the protection, they want all that. What compromises are you willing to make to, I guess, limit the power of the um, SROs in, in the event that they cannot be re removed altogether? So I have heard, and it's not quite confirmed, I don't think the Baltimore SROs are regular police officers, but they don't actually have a gun. 
I was in a Zoom with the state att state's attorney, John McCarthy, and he said actually a very, very interesting thing that I had never heard before. And he said, how about if police officers did not have carry guns for the first three years of their uh, service? How about, he said, I think if I'm, if I'm quoting him correctly, he said, let everybody earn their gun. So maybe that's a model. But I think, Carlos, if we can, if we can, I, I, we should go to communities where there is this demand for SROs and see and ask them, what is it that you want them to do that requires a gun, that requires a badge? Yes, you know, you're talking about mentorship. Why does a, why does a mentor have to have a gun? Right? What part of their function needs a gun? Thank okay. you. Thank you for that. That was a good answer. Thank you. Okay. Well, um, I think we're ready to wrap this up. Thank you very much for your time. We appreciate it. And uh, we'll, we'll let you know. We're gonna, I'll send you the list of people that were here, but also we're going to post this on, I think the Tacoma Park Mobilization has offered to post it on their YouTube channel. So. Wow. We'll do it later. Thank you. Okay. Um, thanks, everybody. Thank you very thanks. much. Have Thank a good you. night. Thank you. Thank you, Sunil. Thanks, Scott. Bye.